morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, our webinar today, Customer Success is Your Success. But I think the main topic is five ways to boost, uh, to boost retention. Um, my name is Guy Nirpaz. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tutango. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about five strategies to boost retention. I know that the audience is of uh, mixed experience. Some people are already kind of, uh, very deep into customer success, while some others are just getting their first uh, steps into the subject. And I will try to be um, to start everything from the beginning. And please feel free to use the question uh, box to get the, uh, further on the questions, and I'll be happy to answer each and every question. So without further ado, five strategies to boost retention. So the market realities today are such that most of software businesses are uh, either operating or turning into subscription uh, business models. And in the subscription business model, uh, the key challenge is to keep, you know, obviously acquire customers, but then keep them and grow them over time. In other words, maximizing customer lifetime value. And the challenge is, when, once we think about this from the customer perspective, it's very easy to get in, but also extremely easy to get out. So how do you actually retain customers, and what do you do about that? And that's the topic of this uh, presentation. So the first strategy is manage your customer's journey and not the renewal event. So a lot of um, a lot of people uh, are sometimes confused with the challenge of customer success. How do I retain customers? Um, it used to be that you acquire customers, you get most of the money up front, and then you support the customers. But from a challenge perspective, the business is already kind of got paid off by selling the potential. Now. Uh, the word has changed, and and it's now it's about uh, uh, being able to, de to actually deliver the value to the customers because they can they can always opt out. And uh, the the business models of monthly monthly contracts or even annual contracts or biannual contracts still make it very easy for customers to assess and evaluate the value they're getting from an online service and if, if the service is not meeting their business expectations and they're, or they're unable to get the business outcomes, they have to, uh, you know, they will look for alternatives and alternatives are available and they will uh, opt out. So what does a company do in between uh, acquisition and, and renewal of customers? So we like to use um, you know, to define the role of the customer success team as the team that is responsible for keeping the promise to the customer. When we sell subscription, we don't actually sell. You know, you should think about it. We, we lease a service. It's not really being sold. It, you know, and, and, and in most cases, the fact that it's delivered online, people have access to it. And uh, and the reason that companies or individuals buy technology or software subscriptions is to uh, meet the business uh, requirements that they have. If I'm a marketing person, I'm buying marketing software to get more leads. If I'm a salesperson, I'm buying CRM to optimize my sales process and so forth. So the objective of the customer success team is make this reality for the customer. So the customer success team focuses on keeping the promise for the customer because they've bought the idea, the potential of the value, and and the realization of the value is something that is within the responsibility of the customer um, success organization. It is their responsibility, but not their sole responsibility because it goes beyond just one team within the organization. And we like to think about the world in the sense of um, customer journey. So if you look at the green line, right, that's the optimal journey of a customer in a subscription business. They sign up and immediately they get the, the first value and sustainable value and growing over time. That's kind of where we want them to be. However, they have many uh, options and choices where things can go wrong. And all those decision points 
um, are the points in which churn happens or downgrades happens and so forth, which means that uh, the objective of the company or the objective of the customer success team is to drive value through the customer journey. In other words, when we think about recurring revenue business, we should also think about recurring value, right? It's, it's this thing where a company needs to, on an ongoing basis, think about the value for the customers and make sure that along the journey they have value points uh, and, and meet them. Some businesses, the first value is just on their way to the actual value, right? You get the system set up and, and you know, get the, the project kicked off and the onboarding in place and getting there. But at the end of the day, if I'm going to ask my, you know, when I'm going to assess my uh, marketing team about the technology that they select, the question is not going to be, you know, are you happy with the user interface or with the functionality? The question is going to be, do you really create more leads for us, right? Is, is sales getting more leads? And are you using the right tools to get more leads for the business? And this is the, the, the key question that um, the customers ask themselves. Do I get the business outcome through the, through, uh, through the customer journey? So a customer journey is very important because it helps us as businesses design the optimal way in which we believe customers should go through and also being able to identify points in this way where things could go wrong or when they go wrong, we, we should be aware of that and take action accordingly to fix that. So if onboarding project is slow to, uh, to mature, then we need to fix this. Or if there are business requirements that are changing from the business perspective, being able to identify this at on time and, you know, fix it is what will prevent uh, churn. So in, in other words, when we say uh, manage the customer journey and not the churn event, if a decision has already been made, it's just very hard to reverse it. So if you monitor carefully the customer journey and you make sure that it is on the, the right track, which is the green track, and you identify points in which uh, green is turning into yellow, you can actually impact churn. So if you are, if you have a good journey, then you have no churn and maximum renewal. If you don't think about the journey, you're just trying to wake up 90 days before renewal and think about, okay, so, you know, let's give a call to all the customers and ask them to renew, you'll get surprised and blindsided. And that kind of leads me to the, uh, to the next, uh, uh, next point, which is improve product engagement across all users. From the data that we've collected and from industry data, we've learned that 90% of churn is preceded by poor product usage. Um, and by that we mean that uh, usage is basically leading indication into value being delivered. And by operating on leading indication and leading indicators, we can actually predict but more importantly, impact the outcome. So the objective, if you will, if you're trying to make it very tangible for the customer success team or the product team, is to improve the monthly active users, the weekly active users, the daily active users of the product. Because this is a, it's not usage for the sake of usage. It's usage for the sake of getting the business outcome. If I'm not creating a landing page in a marketing platform, I'm not going to capture leads. So I need to, you know, encourage my customers to actually do that. And by doing that, they will get to the business outcome that they're looking for. And if they're not doing that, they're not investing their time and resources in, you know, uh, trying to get to the business outcome, they will not get to the business outcome. So usage is very critical in a way we, we should uh, uh, look at that. And, and usage is not just – you know, number of logins. Logins is important, but it's how often do users use the product? Who are the users that use the product? If it's a web conferencing product, is the CEO use the web conferencing? Is it just, you know, the IT department that uses that? Is it the marketing? Is it the sales? Or when they use it, what do they do? Do they actually use it in a very minimal functional way or they use it in, the, in a deep way which kind of puts that, – that shows that they, 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 they value the, the advanced features of the product, hence they're invested. And, you know, if we want to look at that from another dimension, who are our power users? You know, how do we know who are our power users? Which companies – which of our customers have power users in them? And 
we have a very kind of um, we've designed one of the you know, key features in Tatango was to be able to identify uh, power users. Who are the users that are using the product in, a, in such a way that shows us that they are the power users? And with power users, we can learn about our advocacy. We can learn about, you know, what is it in our product that they like and what is it that they don't like. This could be the basis of our customer advisory board, right? These are the people that really value the product that we, that, uh, that we uh, uh, create. And I think it is clear that the more power users that we have, the more daily users and weekly users that we have, the more uh, advocates we have as, as a business, the more advocates we have within a company, the less likelihood that there's going to be a uh, higher force that's going to impact uh, the transition of our solution uh, versus um, some a new uh, competitive solution that have one more feature or 25% less uh, in cost that, you know, it's very hard to compete with. The third point, uh, point number three in the five strategies of improving customer retention is create a health score that you can actually trust. Many companies started uh, initially realizing that they have to understand the customer situation. Is the customer really happy? Do they really like the service we are providing? And initially, before it was all digital, Net Promoter Score was the best way. You survey the customer, you ask them a bunch of questions, they give you, a, they give you an answer, and, and you know. But over time, we've learned that NPS – um, may have been a very good tool in the past, but uh, we, we've known over the years also the deficiencies of the NPS, right? And, and if you can see here, the, uh, the Forrester analyst, Richard Evanson, um, really critiques the NPS and, and does not feel that it's, it, it's actually a metric that you can trust with, with regards to uh, customer satisfaction. Now when we're selling products online and we have a digital footprint, we have sensors into our customers. And having sensors, and as we wrote in the Customer Success Manifesto that is available on customersuccessmanifesto.com, action speaks louder than words. And when people are actually uh, um, showing signs of commitment to a product, we know that they are satisfied. If they don't show those signs of commitment, we know that their satisfaction is lower, and we know that the retention is, is more fragile. So not using the digital footprint that we currently have and putting – that basically means that we have sensors into customer actions is just losing a significant uh, and key indication into customer satisfaction and relying on uh, subjective – uh, word, word of mouth type of, type of analysis of customer status versus being able to, um, to look at those key metrics. And when I talk about metrics of, you know, true health score, I talk about multiple dimensions. One is, of course, the user engagement, right? What do they do? How often do they do that? How much time do they spend? How many active users from a company are actually using versus the ones that, uh, that are not using the product? How many, Users are actually committed and, and use the, uh, the committed versions, the most engaged features of the product. The second thing that kind of, uh, re, uh, that kind of ties into something that I've talked before is, is the customer really getting the business outcomes? And, we, and most of the business outcomes are measurable today because the products are digital, so you can measure the business outcomes. If I continue with the metaphor as I had before around marketing software, so we can track digitally the number of leads that we create every week. So if the trend is going up, then it's good. If the trend is going down, then it's bad, and there's something that needs to be fixed. And obviously, we know that over time, if trends of leads going down, this will lead to customer dissatisfaction, which will lead to um, customer trust issues, which will lead to uh, consideration of replacement, which will lead to churn, right? So you have the early indication in which you can uh, look at and 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 and, um, and identify ahead of time. Another part is service utilization, right? 
if it's a seed-based model, how many seats are actually being used versus the ones that are actually being uh, have been sold. And if the ratio makes sense, then, you know, it's good. If the ratio does not make sense, at some point the customer will realize that and will uh, downsize the, the implementation. So um, so it could be the, the you know, license utilizations or modules utilization or quota utilization. These are all metrics that are digital and could be uh, measured. And there are other other digital touch points like support tickets, outstanding invoices, customer data that lives in other customer systems that could be incorporated into a, a true health score that you can actually uh, trust. And by combining all that uh, and and building building a health score that is that is actually um, not only it's not generic, it's uh, it's profile based. So you can you build a health score per segment, right? Every customer segment has a different health score. Every customer in the customer journey has a different configuration of a health score. But at the end of the day, as a business user, I know exactly if the customer is red, yellow, or green, and if it's trending up or down, and what is the reason that the customer is red, yellow, or green. I can actually take the right action uh, on time to make sure that most of my customers, most of the time, are green. And that's kind of the key with a health score that you can actually trust. And, you know, here you can see some screenshots of the level of fidelity in which you should have in order to figure out the right health score for, uh, for the customer. Point number four. Engage with customers in a smart and relevant way. We are all very busy. And, you know, I thank you again for being with us today at this webinar. Uh, but your customers are busy as well. And uh, we don't have a lot of time. And our lives are becoming more and more crowded with things that we need to do and things we, we need to take care of. And... Um, and when we think about it from the customer's perspective, the customers are expecting better experiences. They're expecting uh, timely experiences. They're expecting valuable experiences. And as Kerry Boudin, the, the author, the co-author of the book, Outside In, which I highly recommend on reading, uh, uh, has researched and found 81% of customers are willing to pay more for a better customer experience. And when we say customer experience, we, just, we don't just mean around you know, being polite and, 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 and being nice. That's table stakes, right? You're not going to buy from someone who insults you. It's not, uh, you know, um, it's not that time anymore. It's this thing where uh, valuable experiences that make a lot of sense for us as, as, uh, as customers. And when we talk about smart engagement, we talk about, Proactive engagement, we talk about, uh, you know, timely engagement at the right time. We talk about uh, intelligent engagement, which means that it's contextual and it's relevant and it's the right, uh, it's the right message at the right, at the right time. If I've been trying to do something with an online product, I don't want to repeat everything that I've already provided with the, in the online forms. I want to continue from where I was, right? If it was a credit card issue, just fix the credit card issue. If it was, you know, I was confused with a package that I was selecting, just help me find the next package that I'm looking for. Don't start asking me all those questions again or take advantage of moments in time that, you know, I'm looking for one thing. I'm opening a support case. You're trying to sell me something else. That's That's not... That's not the way uh, customers value. And if you are able to deliver reliable and consistent experience, this is where you are able to master um, uh, smart uh, smart engagement. And in the uh, customer success manifesto, we've called this contextual engagement. Right? It's within the right context, right moment, the right message for the right reason. And um, and it's hard. It's, it's, it's really hard. But, you know, if you want to think about how to implement that, you should think about, you know, what do you do in your business in order to be consistent about, uh, you know, experiences. And in most cases, you should think software in mind, right? How can you build scalable model which, which is consistent? Think about the rules that you can put in software to implement, uh, implement that. 
Um, one of our uh, customers, Mark Fordham, the VP of Services of Central Desktop, that has been operating in the space for, for quite some time, uh, when he was speaking at the second annual Customer Success Summit uh, on March in San Francisco, he had a very interesting slide that I'm very happy to share with you. This is a progression of customer engagement over time. And, you know, you can, you can see that the progression is from, you know, support responsive into client services, into account management, to renewal management, and into customer management, you know, this day and age. Which means that, you know, if, if we look at that, this is kind of a, a company's perspective of how they morphed their engagement with customers. But if we think about it from the market perspective, it also reflects the customer expectations that have changed over time. Think about the younger generation. Think about your kids. What are their expectations when it comes to customer engagement? These are the types of uh, engagement that you should think about when you implement within uh, within your companies. And... As I mentioned before, customers reward it and are willing to pay more for better experiences. The last point that I want to um, emphasize is we call it empower all customer-facing teams with the right data. Um, and before I jump into this point, um, if we take a step back and we think about uh, how customers perceive a company or a brand, uh, they don't usually differentiate the departments. They, you know, when they talk to marketing or when they talk to sales or when they talk to support, they talk to the brand. When I talk, when I, I'm taking a flight, regardless of, uh, you know, if it's the, uh, uh, the, 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 the crew team or the, the ticketing, uh, the, the, the guy, the ticketing, ticketing desk or whomever, I'm talking to United. Uh, they, they, it, these, all these folks represent United. If I'm getting a bad seat, it's the guy on the on the ground and uh, and the stewardess on the, on on the, on the plane. They're all kind of uh, um, re, uh, responsible for or accountable, in my perspective, to the experience that I'm getting as as a as a customer. So, what do we do as a business to make sure that everyone that is facing with uh, customers has the right customer context to provide this contextual uh, a meaningful engagement uh, at, at the point of contact. So before I start, kind of why we should do that, right, besides being really good about doing it, there's a research by the Aberdeen Group that shows that companies that have built a centralized customer um, customer insights, right, it's a, it's a repository of all customer information and the insight information around customers. Every company that has built that, had, on average, 3.5 uh, times more retention rate and, uh, and a growth rate of 20% or more of a year over year, right? That's, you know, you can read the research of Omer and Cara from the Aberdeen Group, which means that if you do this, you, you make good business. The question is, how do we think about, you know, how do we think about customer data? Because today, customer data is buried in many customer systems. We have... Uh, you know, product uh, systems, the backtracking, the feature requests. We have the, the marketing systems that capture leads and, and engagement on the website. We have sales uh, sales systems, CRMs. We have customer success systems. We have uh, service systems. We have finance and, and billing systems that capture all that. And if we are going to continue with this approach that we have a, a, a functional organization that has a functional system that has parts of the customer information in it, we're, either, we're going to continue in not being able to deliver consistent and complete uh, um, service to our customers. And the approach that uh, I highly recommend, and this is actually what we implement into Tango, is to empower all the customer six, uh, systems from a centralized um, from a centralized customer engagement system. So whenever there is an engagement uh, of a function, a customer-facing function, support, sales, product, uh, marketing, with a customer, it's highly contextual. You have all the customer information, the history, the insights. When they open a support case, you know if they're about to renew and if they're a happy customer or not, right? And then that impacts the way support 
uh, uh, handles the ticket, and they don't think about it as a ticket. They think about the customer behind the ticket. And the same way in sales, the same way in marketing, uh, and the same way in you know just about everything that the company does. If you're able to do that, you're you're making a, a much better informed uh, decisions and actions by the customer facing teams that uh, that will make the customer experience much better. So. Think about it in a way that, you know, this integrated success approach is around providing the right data for every team. So at the point of interaction, they have the context in which they will go operate in the right, in the right way. And they're not going to, you know, come up with uh, boilerplate answers when these boilerplate answers are not, uh, are not appropriate, right? So that's, uh, that's how, you, how we should think about this uh, uh, problem. And um, yeah, th that's a quote from Alex Brower, one, um, the VP of Operations and Finance of one of the fastest-growing uh, SaaS companies in the mobile s space, Criticism. And the way they've they've thought about the problem is that customer success, and they're they're not the only ones, but they're, they're uh, leading the uh, the charge. And Customer success is not one function. Customer success is part of every function within the organization, and by doing that, they've been able to uh, to support an amazing growth uh, over the past few years. Uh, so with that, uh, now we've concluded the five uh, strategies for uh, retention. And, uh, you know, before we jump into the Q&A section, just kind of wanted to give you kind of a brief over, overview of, uh, of the Tango. So we've been operating in the customer success, customer engagement space for the past few years. Uh, we've pioneered a lot of the uh, concept and the ideas that uh, have been expressed in this uh, presentation, the customer success journey, uh, and so forth. Uh, we've been, uh, we have more than uh, 150 uh, customers um, that are using Tango for multiple use cases of customer success. These could be very big companies, could be very uh, up-and-coming young startups, but uh, you can see some of the logos on this, uh, on this slide. And the service that Tango provides is a complete customer success platform that contains a complete customer success solution. We help our customers with modeling their customer success journeys and being able to uh, adhere customer success strategies. And we are a data company and, and believe that there's a lot that is available within the data around customers that is going to enforce uh, uh, the right approaches to customers uh, uh, to make it, uh, to make good experiences. So we use uh, data data strategies and data science capabilities to empower our customers uh, through that. And with that, I'll uh, hand it to Christine to lead the Q&A uh, section. Thank you for now. Thank you, Guy. Um, so I want to encourage the audience at this time to go ahead and submit any questions they might have about the five strategies to boost retention. There's an Ask a Question tab at the top of the module. Um, go ahead and submit those. So, guys, are viewing them. Um, if you can't stay for um, Q and A, I also want to encourage people to rate this webinar and give us feedback, and maybe submit any other questions you might have. So, let's dive into Q and A um, as you, um, audience members, continue to submit. One of them is: um, So, guys, does the ownership of renewals typically fall under sales or customer success? So, yeah, so, so who owns renewals? So in many cases, renewals from a number perspective falls under sales, right, because these are the numbers guys. They, they carry the quota and they take care of. But in order for renewal to work, there needs to be someone in the company that is responsible to manage the customer journey, and that is customer success. So in most cases, uh, we see two types of structures. One of them is that uh, the number of customers who renew is uh, the responsibility of the customer success team. The number of dollars who renew is the responsibility of the sales team, and in most cases, that is joint responsibility. Similar to the concept in which marketing and sales are responsible for revenue, 
because marketing, getting the leads, sales is closing the deals, but it's a joint effort. If marketing is not going to create the leads, there's, going to be, there's not going to be revenue. Same thing here. If customer success is not going to uh, deliver, uh, you know, good implementation with the customer, making sure that the value is being delivered, they're not going to be able to, uh, to renew customers. Great, thank you. So someone early on in the um, presentation had asked regarding um, strategy number one, um, when you say keep the promise with your customer, you mean it in regards to the product, just the service, or both? So do you see customer success managers are responsible for everything in the product, even if it's not something that CSM can really control, like an error in the product? Yeah, uh, that's a very actually a very good question, and I kind of uh, we can talk about this for a while. But um, the short answer it's not about the product; it's about the customer. So keeping the price for the customer is about being able to make sure that the customer sees the business outcome of the service that is being sold to. Right, and if their business problem was, uh, let's take a uh, um, collaboration platform as an example. If the if the challenge was getting the the company to collaborate better, better, then the promise for the customer is, are we actually collaborating better? I think that it's true that in some, some use cases it's hard to measure that. In some use cases it's easier to measure. But at the end of the day, it's this question where you ask the customer, you know, did we deliver, right? Did we uh, uh, actually help you collaborate better or not? And if the answer is yes, then you kept the promise. If, you, if the answer is no, no, you didn't keep the promise. And for that reason, you're right that, you know, it has a lot to do with, you know, is the product the right product? Does it work okay? Does, that, do you sell the right promise? And do you, can you actually deliver? So, you know, I've been, I've been uh, um, thinking about this for, for quite some time, and I think th there is part of product uh, mindset in customer success teams. Right, because uh, although the product team in general thinks about, you know, uh, all customers and all use cases in a very generic way, the customer success team needs to map the product capabilities into a specific customer's uh, requirements and make sure that this is actually being matched. And this is why customer success team should not be considered as a siloed organization. This is a, a, a team that is focused on Helping customers uh, fulfill their the, the potential of the of the value, right? The business outcome, and uh, and for that reason, they may need many people within the organization. They will need to advocate the customer within the company to the product team, to the sales team, to the marketing team, um, and and so forth. Great. So, guy, go ahead and go ahead and take um, a look through the questions right now. Um, and uh, the, someone had asked what was the first way to boost retention. I just wanted to answer the, the question that it was to manage the customer journey, not just the renewal um, point. So let's go ahead and um, select a new question. Uh, Guy, we have, who is the typical decision maker in the organization for a customer success solution? So they're saying they don't have a team right now. Um, and it seems like many groups might have um, or need buy-in. Where should this person start? Um, this, one, this one is a tough one, but I've seen, uh, in many cases, customer success teams start in boardrooms, meaning that it's, it's, a, it's a big strategic decision for the company. It's not a big decision, but it's a decision of a company uh, to become customer focused and customer centric, and the question is who owns who owns that and it depends a lot on the maturity of companies but uh, uh, you know w when you see um, customer success teams, where do they morph from some cases it 's support and account management that became customer success teams sometimes it 's uh, solution engineering in the product team that has become an independent team of delivering the value to the to the customer. I think the first, first and foremost it starts with the CEO, and the CEO has to make a decision that uh, keeping the promise for the customer is important for the company. And once the CEO makes this decision, then the organizational structure, it's very much, you know, uh, functionally dependent on who, who is the ultimate, you know, VP or executive that is responsible for that and who is actually doing, doing the work. Uh, but if there is no CEO buy-in into customer success, 
uh, mindset, I don't see this successful. So I think, but, but you know, l- luckily I don't see uh, many CEOs in uh, uh, SaaS or subscription businesses that, you know, once they have enough customers, don't get it, right? And so, so this is why we're seeing a uh, significant increase in the number of new customer success leaders and customer success practitioners in the industry in the past 18 months. Great. Okay. So um, someone just submitted a question wanting to know about the implement- implementation process about the Tango. Um, how long does it take to get started to start seeing actionable data? Yeah, so uh, implementation process is, uh, uh, is basically broken into two, uh, um, two sections. There's the business implementation and there's the technical implementation. Uh, you should think about the technical implementation as a uh, you know, plumbing project, right? You connect the data streams into the, data, into the centralized to Tango data set, and, you know, it, it re- really much depends on the complexity of the organization and the data sources, but, you know, I can safely say that it's a matter of, uh, you know, week or two or, you know, uh, for the most part, some of them are more complex than that. Uh, the business implementation is, is even, you know, um, easier in terms of time, but it more requires uh, designing the right customer success process, you know, so designing what is the right health score for your business is, is simple, or at least, it, you know, it's a, it's, it's a short time frame exercise. Uh, more importantly, it's the question, okay, what do we do as a company once we identify uh, a, a negative trend with a customer, who takes ownership, what do they do, and so forth. This is kind of designing the process takes a little bit of time, and what I, I highly recommend is getting the plumbing in very quickly. Uh, and we've seen that companies that have started that very early, even when there were like 10 people start up uh, early in, in the product days, have benefited, benefited significantly uh, once they started scaling their, their businesses. A good example of a company that we've worked for for four years is Zendesk that just went to IPO this year. And... Um, uh, so, so, you know, putting the plumbing in is, 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 is the right thing to do and thinking about the process and the implementation of the, the business practices, you should, we should think about it uh, iteratively. It's as, as similar as our sales process uh, in the early days is different than the sales process once companies mature. Uh, we should think about customer success process implementation as iterative process implementation, which means putting the right process uh, and the right metrics for the right uh, for the for the current time is a is an exercise of a week and uh, and then implementing that and then taking the measures and doing the adjustment and, and improving over time. That's that's the the requirement from our perspective. So to summarize, it's a matter of technical week, one or two weeks of the business uh, business implementation. You're up and running with that. Great, thank you. Okay, so we have five minutes remaining and um, quite a few more questions. So, guys, if you see one you really want to answer, go ahead and start reading it. But um, to kick off the next question, someone um, mentioned that NPS scores are um, used heavily maybe in telcos and other sort of companies. So um, what is the recommendation in going about leading customers away from NPS to this new health metric that you presented? So my answer to NPS is was NPS was a good score when it was the only score that you could have. Right? It, uh, having something is better than nothing in, in some cases, although you could have a lot of false negative or false positives. But you know, it, it, it's better to have something measurable. Uh, I would say that you know you should incorporate NPS into the health score, but it could not be the the most meaningful or the only component in the health score. Right? It should be part of it. Uh, should influence it in it, it some way, but it could be just you know one 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 metric uh, and not necessarily the most important one. Great, I think we have time for maybe one last question. Um, so, given that customer success is a people-intensive function, what percentage of revenue do you recommend SaaS companies actually spend on this function for both tools and the people? Yeah, so I'll start with a joke: as a tool provider, as much as you can, but. Uh, uh but 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 i would i would counter the argument that customer success is a is a people intensive uh function i think uh 
you know, um, what, what we like to think is that customer success, every customer success manager should have a portfolio of customers. And, and when we talk about portfolio, we, we talk about two dimensions on this portfolio, number of customers that I can effectively manage and the value of this portfolio, the, number, the, the total amount of ACV that they can actually control. And I think this is the right metric that you should think about customer success teams. How can you make sure that uh, every customer success manager manages between $2 million in ACV to $5 million in ACV, and the more the merrier while keeping the, you know, the metrics, the, the, health, the health metrics, the churn metrics, the retention metrics at the right at the right way. I think customer success, if they are being uh, positioned as portfolio owners, which means uh, not only that they manage customers, but they also need to increase the value of their portfolio, which means they create more value to customers and with the right pricing and packaging, there's an opportunity to upsell and, and sell more or, or, or higher value uh, products. This is where customer success um, stops being or are being perceived as, you know, a fancy name for support, uh, which is in most cases a cost center, into a, a, a revenue driving center. And if you look at most board meetings, and most, uh, uh, if we think about SaaS business model, we, we think about three revenue streams, new, new customers, renew, and, uh, and growth. And customer success impacts at least the latter two, the renew and growth, which is critical because mature SaaS companies have renewal of more than 50% of their revenue year over year, and in growth they have, you know, they can grow even even more. So uh, the point is that customer success should be treated as portfolio managers, and their objective is to increase the value of their portfolio on an annual basis. Great. Thank you, guys. So I think that that's all the time we have for questions. Um, I am displaying on the screen ways that you can learn more about customer success and Tatango, our website and our blog, blog.tatango.com. You can follow us on Twitter, and you can also follow up with any other questions you might have directly to Guy at gnearpaz at tatango.com or at sales at tatango.com. We want to thank you, everyone, for their time today, and um, we will be reaching out to you to see if you have any other questions. So with that, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining, and feel free to reach out with some more uh, questions and uh, uh, and for follow up on on the discussion. Thank you very much.